Greetings and peace, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me for today's evening. I would like to start start this with the greeting of Bismillah Rahman Rahim in the name of God, the Beneficent, the Most Merciful. So tonight I have the pleasure of being joined by my great brother, Brian Dawson from Japan, who I've listened to since 2012. And I'm so happy that Almighty God has afforded me this opportunity to interview him. And I thank him for all the great work he has done throughout the years against the enemy and defending Islam in a time where Muslims were being scrutinized in America and there was a lot of disinformation and discrimination taking place. So I, I thank him for all that he has stood for and I encourage everybody since he has been eliminated from YouTube to go on ancreport.com to support him. And I wanted him to, on, on this platform specifically to talk about who he is, what he's doing currently, and also to address the Afghanistan situation, what would be the implications for Muslims, not just Muslims, but the Western world in general, and the geopolitical mm -hmm. stuff taking place. So without further ado, I hand it over to Ryan Dawson. Thank you so much. Hey, thanks for following me for such a long time and such a wonderful introduction. And I've been trying to defend, you know, after 9-11, there was this sudden screech of hatred towards the Muslims. And um, Afghanistan, of course, was collectively blamed for what a few members of Al Qaeda did just because some of them had trained in that area. And it never made any sense to me. I made the analogy back in 2001 that if some whack Christian cult from Canada or something came and murdered people in New York, we wouldn't go invade Canada and prop up a new government. But that's what they did in Afghanistan. And really the Al Qaeda group remnants that were in Afghanistan, how did they get there again? Oh, yes, Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan financed part, a branch of the Mujahideen and bin Laden, who's close to the Bushes, brought in his diaspora fighters to fight the Soviets. And even Al Qaeda, their motives are understandable. I mean, I disagree with it, but if I had watched the giant civil war in Lebanon and thousands and thousands of Iraqis starving to death and, uh, you know, all the things that they had to go through based on the Zionist policies of uh, Israel and the United States. And, you know, you've been humiliated. You've seen just cities decimated. And that's what you grew up in. And some imams on the hill, you know, with a loud voice saying this is great Satan. It, it's attractive because you're, you, you're enraged. You want to get revenge on the nations that are doing this to you. Yes thing is you can't just go blow up buildings in new york and that's the same thing the u.s is doing collectively punishing civilians and so on and so on. but they never they don't represent any it's if there was no religion it still would have happened because of <laughs> we were over there killing them that's a normal thing i mean the japanese had kamikaze pilots the vietnamese had suicide bombers occupation is the reason that people get that desperate it's not from religion it wouldn't what, no matter what the religion is, or if there was no religion at all, he'd still get the same thing. So I tried to speak on that, and I tried to talk about the war in Afghanistan. And, you know, a lot of people did oppose the war in Iraq, but when it came to Afghanistan, they were okay with that one. Because that's mm -hmm. Al-Qaeda, right? I said, no, that's we're fighting the Taliban. It's so right. silly. It, it would be like fighting the Koreans after Pearl Harbor. You're Asian, right? <laughs> Same thing? Yeah. No? <laughs> but that's... Uh, well, we did fight the Koreans shortly after that in the Korean War. But, you know, it's finally coming to an end. And the Taliban is obviously going to be the faction that will be in charge. They've taken many of the cities. More specifically, the Pashtun within the Taliban is the, mm -hmm. the ethnic group with the most swagger, I suppose. And that's how it is over there. It's very tribal. And you can't change that through the barrel of a gun. And it doesn't yes. matter if you agree with it or not. It's their country, not ours. And it's not our decision. And um, I'm just happy the war is ending. One thing the Taliban will do, and, I, and I'm not going to agree with them or any other faction probably on women's rights and this and that, but they will end the opium trade. So, yeah. Because that was one of the reasons they got so mad at them. And one of the actual reasons the U.S. invaded Afghanistan 
was because the Taliban had crushed the opium trade almost to zero. I say almost because you can never stop all of the black markets, but it 90 some plus percent uh, subtraction once the Taliban started burning poppy fields. They got kicked out and you ask veterans finish their tour of duty, second tour of duty in Afghanistan. What did you do? I was guarding poppy fields. Mm-hmm. Like, and, you know, got to get that morphine, the heroin, heroin base, got to make Oxycontin for the Sackler family, you know, got to profit off the drugs. And that's caused global problems throughout the West and everywhere else where they're pushing either the pills from prescriptions or the illegal street version. And then you got a lot of veterans and others that are self-medicating and some unfortunately turn to heroin and almost uh, 90 some percent of that's out of Afghanistan. And prior to that was Vietnam. Yeah, right? uh, because I went to so many uh, people that I went to school with, Brother Ryan, here in the Philadelphia area. So many people that I know that have died from opioid overdoses. Oh, and nice. I, I pray that their their soul rests in peace and all of the suffering that I've seen in this country in terms of a lot of the drugs that were being brought from there to here. So I'm thankful that at least something good is coming out of it. Yeah, the hardest hit state was New Jersey. Uh, yeah. Because the CIA on an airport there in Newark, and they were bringing it. That's like everyone knows that I think they were bringing <laughs> in the heroin, and so it's sort of the first rung of distribution was out of or the surrounding areas in New Jersey, and yeah. those people got hit hard. And it it trickles. It goes to Philly is another hub because it's a major mm-hmm. city in Pennsylvania, and you know it goes throughout the eastern seaboard and one of the major ones is new jersey for heroin and then down south is where they're bringing in the the cocaine and things in miami and new orleans and so on and and these are not like secret drug lanes people know this you know uh but and people know the cia brings in drugs they have they have to know since they ran contra i mean they got caught red-handed with a plane going down they were bringing guns in and they're bringing drugs out did the same thing in vietnam also heroin uh nicaragua was coke and marijuana but you know that that will be a significant blow because i don't think the taliban you were asking what will be one of the immediate changes well the opium trade is is going to be decimated that's one good thing about the taliban taking charge and the Northern Alliance that the U.S. had propped up, it, you know, what happened over time was this this year was 20th, the 20th year of the war. Yeah. All, all the different opposition groups to the Taliban were whatever they started as is not what they ended up as because the most corrupt, underhanded, like willing to work with the U.S. type of people rose to the leadership positions within these other factions. And so you end up with just a bunch of Weasley profiteer in it to win it for myself type of characters. And it doesn't matter what their group they was or what they used to do, um, because all the weasels were the ones that ascended because that's the ones the U.S. were uh, most happy to work with and realize, oh, this guy will do anything for money. You know, that's the, the loyalty. Yeah. So no one wants to fight for these people. So the Taliban is taking cities without a shot fired because they're like, oh, I'm not following this guy. I never wanted him to be the leader anyway. They, he's just there because the Americans picked him. We didn't pick him, you know. And they, the U.S. is so silly. They are putting people in areas and telling them to defend it when they have no family no, there, no tribal affiliation there. And they're like, why would I risk my life for this town, you know. Uh, they don't get it. And uh, so you're watching this all unfold. They thought it would last two years. Then you saw them say 90 days. And it took about three days. <laughs> <laughs> the Taliban is taking Afghanistan faster than Iraq uh, defeated the Peshmerga Kurds when they tried to secede. I mean, that shows you the whole time. The only thing that was propping up the government was the American military. Mm-hmm. And now that they're leaving, it's on. I mean, there's there's no way. And these people know 
they're going to get tortured to death after all the abuse they've put on, like raping little boys and all the stuff that organized state organized. This is not like just rogue criminals. This is what they do. Oh, their comeuppance is coming because the Taliban is there. I saw this beautiful picture of them surrounding the president's desk. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I said, if you were to take that and then you take the picture in the Oval Office in the 1980s of Ronald Reagan's Freedom Fighters. Yes, it's it's almost identical, like the physician, yeah. except Reagan's in the middle. But it's, it's just like, here's your freedom fighters. Uh, that's what you started with the Mujahideen. You've finally been kicked out. The Soviets have been kicked out. The Americans are leaving. And the Taliban are going to control Afghanistan. Now, that's not all positives. The Taliban has its downside, too. But just the, the fact that drug trade is probably going to end and the conflict will end because you're going to have a concise winner. That's mm -hmm. what Afghanistan needs. Somebody needs their turn at the wheel without a, a war. Because when, as long as a war is going, nothing else can get done. But a huge mystery to me is I just heard the U.S. spent $2.2 trillion over the 20 years there. Where did all that money go? Because other than the base, we didn't build anything. Where's these uh, women's colleges and all this crap we heard was going to happen? Like, where are the the roads, you know, not dirt roads, like paved highways and what? Where did you spend all this money? It went all, it's all administrative, just garbage where they paid themselves through the theme of, well, we're reconstructing Afghanistan. Very reminiscent of all U.S. reconstructions, I mean, even of itself. When the South went through reconstruction, that that just meant taxing them to spend the money in the North. Yeah. And uh, same thing. They're just well, they taxed us all again to go pay a bunch of Lockheed Martin and Halliburton style Bechtel profiteers. Afghanistan got almost nothing except for the little weasels that were willing to work with the U.S. to oppress their own people. And uh, now they're on the run trying to cling on to the back of airplanes. Three people <laughs> fell yesterday. They're hanging on to the undercarriage. What do you think? You you think this is a movie where you can just hang on to the bottom of a plane until it lands when it's going 500 miles an hour? Uh-uh. Yeah. Unfortunately. Trampled to death some people trying to get out of Kabul. And it's like, why are you running? Did you do something wrong? Are you scared of the Taliban for some reason? They know it. They've been they've been stealing. They're the most corrupt government on earth. Worse than North Korea was the puppet regime in Afghanistan. Sickening. Basically, you let drug cartels become the government. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And it's it's interesting because um, I'm originally from Pakistan, and over there we have the Pashtun people as well, and they follow this very tribal code called Pashtun Wali. Mm -hmm. And for them, they for them when it's time to do justice for them, they're really going to come after you. And I think that's what's happening in Afghanistan right now. Yeah, I said it's like Afghanistan's Comanche. Yeah, that, they were the Native Americans that when you needed uh, to get rid of some soldiers, that's who you went to go get. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. and it's interesting. How do you see the implications? Not just you already pointed out the Afghanistan situation, but how do you see? this affecting america in any way with the situation going and people are upset at the leadership and people are just not happy they're saying that that 20 trillion dollars that you spent i see so many two, homeless 2. people 2, here. Yeah. i see so many homeless people here and they could have helped yeah. so many people here and i see people here they're mad well and a I lot of the like homeless also is tied back to the opium addiction Mm -hmm. That most homeless people are drug addicts like because uh, you can get welfare and you can get like if you're functional, but they um, they all have mental problems. If you talk to them, it's pretty clear they're you know, something wrong upstairs. It yeah. takes very little effort if you live in the United States to find to have some kind of shelter or something. Uh, you might be out of a job and poor as hell and get, living on food stamps, but you'll. You don't have to live in the street unless you're strung out on drugs. And that's all tied together. And you can just see things collapsing in the U.S. too. 
there's scat apps in San Francisco. There's so many homeless. And so, all over Portland, There's you can find syringes like you'd find plastic bottles. It's just a common item of trash is needles. And why are so many people so depressed and turning to drugs? Like you have all the opportunity and riches around you and they're miserable and doing drugs. So they're missing other important parts of their life, I would say. Um, you may argue they're missing a spiritual element. I think there's, I agree with Ted Kaczynski, if you've ever read his work on like a lot of the ills in modern society, but it's the biggest drug consumption is in the United States, especially in uh, liberal cities, it seems like. And of course. yeah, you're right. People sleeping outside and people um, just falling apart, killing themselves, doing drugs, and they don't care. That's the most common form of suicide is intentionally ODing on this drug or that. And uh, yeah, ending the opioid crisis will cut off the supply. So that will help with the U.S., but... You know, I would love to say, well, now we're not going to be wasting all this money in Afghanistan, but you know that you're going to waste it on something else. <laughs> and then you've got the media acting like this is the worst thing Biden has ever done. This is the only good thing Biden has done. Now, he's doing the right thing for the wrong reasons, because I, I have my I have my opinions on why we're actually ending the war in Afghanistan. It has nothing to do with any sort of altruism or anything, but. Joe Biden has done everything wrong from day one. I mean, he got rid of federal voter ID. He opened the border. He got rid of, he, he recreated dependency on Middle Eastern oil, which of course that wouldn't be a problem if we weren't such bitches to Israel. We wouldn't have all these conflicts and we wouldn't be so hated in the Middle East and we could just buy the oil from Iraq and Iran or whatever. But now we're dependent on the Saudis because we pissed everyone else's off because of the foreign policy directed by the Zionists in Israel. But that is the case, and so now we're dependent on them again. And he's just one thing after another, inflation, the just the destruction of jobs, botch the COVID. Like, so he finally does something good. Let's get out of Afghanistan, which is our because Trump was saying the same thing. He's the one that made the deal with the Taliban back in February of 2020. Yeah. And they all hated it when he did it. Mm -hmm. Right. But there are a lot of Trump supporters that thought it was a good idea. Now that Biden's doing it, the media all hates it that he's doing it, too. But the, the Trump supporters that liked it when Trump tried to do it hate it now that Biden's done it. So you can see the <laughs> tribal loyalties there. And then they criticize the Pashtun or whomever in Afghanistan for being tribal. And I'm thinking, hey, Democrat, Republican, like that's you. Right. You. It's bad when Bush went to war. It's okay when Obama goes to war. He, you can topple Libya, but not Fallujah. I mean, Benghazi, bad. Fallujah, good. Or the reverse, right? So we the tribal nature of people doesn't go away. Uh, they just got different words for it in the U.S. or wherever. It's everywhere. Japan's got the LDP and da-da-da-da-da. And that is their tribe. Now, it's not ethnic. It's like... It is a little bit geographic, though, but it is a sort of ideological thing with no philosophy behind it. Very yeah. few people have a philosophy or a theology anymore. They have ideology, and ideology is what someone devoid of philosophy clings to. It's just like a prescription, like, here's my lit. What's my party say? Oh, that's me then, you know, and uh, it's just sort of group think, um, you know, this is my tribe right or wrong american exceptionalism is also a tribe in a sense because it's like my buddy was wearing a shirt i designed that said it's not terrorism when we do it and had a picture of the atomic bomb and uh they justify that they well that's my team like it's a sports team or something <laughs> well that's not terrorism but you blew up a city twice yes that's terrorism how yes. <laughs> what is more what was <laughs> What's worse, knocking down three buildings in New York or, you know, all of New York? Because that's what you did in Hiroshima. That's what you did in Nagasaki. You blew up the whole city. Uh, and the firebombing Dresden and Cologne. So that, it is terrorism. And uh, no, no, how would we do it? Now, that's tribalism. Because if you have any sense of reason, you'd say, no, if it's wrong for someone to do it to us, it's wrong for us to do them. 
it's one of the basic tenets in a lot of religion is you know do unto others as you'd have them do unto you it's uh <clears throat> christ figure would say in christianity or jesus is a prophet in islam would say the same thing of course and, yep and um the main the most quoted prophet actually in, and you not know, in christianity i think elijah is quoted more but in the islam i think it's jesus I don't sit there and count it, but yeah. Rather than mention this because in the I follow the Sufi tradition, which is like the more more Islamic mysticism, yeah. Yeah, the spiritual side. And for me, I came to this country when I was five years old and I saw the oneness in all paths. I went to Bible school the same day, Quran classes, uh, the local Sikh temple, and I saw that oneness of humanity, that everyone is kind of teaching you the truth in their own way. And when the 9-11 thing happened, I was in third grade and I was growing up in America in the post 9-11 world. Oh, which kind of shocked me that what is going on? I, I see everybody doing the same thing. They're working together. Their kids are going to school together. Everyone's trying to feed their families and survive. What is it? Who's pushing this us versus them mentality? And then that just continued until yeah. 2011, 2012. It's hard to get my head around third That's grade 9-11. So I was in third grade, people were still talking about Vietnam. And I was like, that was so long ago. I was in third grade in the 80s, Vietnam ends in the 70s. So, so <laughs> I mean, we're, we're all 20 years removed from Afghanistan. We're 17 years removed from the Iraq War. And I'm still talking about the Iraq War. So as a kid, I thought the 70s, was so long ago. Well, that's like saying 2003 was so long ago, you know, yeah. and I was hearing a lot about Vietnam and our fourth grade field trip was to the Vietnam Memorial. We went to the wall and saw all the names and da, da, da. now veteran statues and things are being torn down. Uh, Antifa is out there. I saw a great meme that said the Taliban is defending itself from a regime that has face coverings, topples statues and supports uh chemical lobotomies in children you know changing their sex <laughs> and i say yeah that's the woke left all right toppling yeah. down statues of veterans giving hormone replacement theory period to children and everybody's got to wear their corona mask everywhere right so i was like yeah hey, i thought you were against wearing mask now you're like <laughs> you won't let anyone go outside without it it's hilarious but yeah third grade when 9 11 happened so you never got to experience you only had, you know, eight or three years because you can move when you're five, three years of like pre 9-11 America. That sucks because it wasn't like it is now when I was a kid. It, it, we, we changed so much. It's unrecognizable. You know, it's it's so beautiful because growing up in this country, I never lost faith in the American people. And what Islam teaches us is that wherever you live, you have to respect the laws and the customs of the country that you live in. So I did that. I tried to fit in as much as I could. And I realized that everywhere that I went through middle school, high school, college, and when I found yourself in 2012, a year after high school, was that there was that human element within all of us that was trying to do the right thing and trying to find the truth, which I would also like for you to explain that all the great things that you have done in terms of your advocacy for Islam and Palestine and all that you're doing, doing to protect basic human rights and why the enemy sees you as a threat. Yeah. Um, and my motivation for standing up for Palestine or Iraq or Libya or Syria is like last <laughs> last 20 years of my life. I've been defending these areas. It seems one after another. And uh, they happen to be Muslim. But if they weren't, I would still be doing it. It's just to me, it's uh, all humans faith or atheist doesn't matter peace is there's nothing worse than war there's nothing more pointless than a bunch of strangers lining up and shooting at each other and lobbing you know blowing up buildings and things there's got to be a better way to resolve conflicts and of course there is and yeah. i see this prejudice towards a religion i've seen prejudice towards atheism too but in the current situation it's the islamic world that is just getting pummeled and you've got these radical Zionists, Jewish supremacists, which is not Judaism either any more than the, the Klan is Christianity or some Salafist Wahhabi head chopper in Syria represents Islam. It's uh, these radical 
uh, racist Jews that are colonizing Palestine for the, in their minds, the chosen race of God. And they racially segregate the West Bank. They have settlements where the only Jews can live and they tear down private property and build houses. And I'm like, how the hell can this happen? And the world community is like, eh, there's no moral principle. It's all about wealth and whatnot. And it's like, there, you could not do that anywhere else. You couldn't go into Mexico and build uh, white-only houses or something or Christian-only, th- this whatever. You could never do that anywhere. But it happens in Palestine. And it happens with no criticism from the U.S. media. Right. None. They won't even say, not only would that say it's wrong, they just won't even say what they're doing half the time. How many times has Israel bombed Syria this summer? I don't even know. And I reported on it. <laughs> yeah, I've lost count. That's an act of war. You know, if Syria bombed Israel once, that that would be headline news 24 hours a day. They'd be screaming anti-Semitic from the hilltops and there'd be blimps in the air or whatever. It would be like January 6th where, the, you know, people were protesting vote fraud and they had called it insurrection. Of course, when a a high school child had a MAGA hat on the Lincoln Memorial steps. They acted like he was some, you know, um, neo-Nazi out there or whatever. I mean, it was just like a kid with a MAGA hat smiling as a grown Native American is banging a drum in his face and you've got the black Hebrew Israelites is cussing up a storm and yelling at him and this and that. And he, he did nothing. He just standing still. He smiled at one point nervously and they like, look at him smirking. <laughs> And uh, God damn, they were just on a field trip, and that's where they were told to to um, meet the rest of their classmates. So we had to just stand there <laughs> and take it. And the left went nuts on this kid. And so, of course, the Capitol riot, they go nuts. But when Barack Obama and Joe Biden blow up Libya and make slavery great again and hand the country over to al-Qaeda and the surplus weapons pour into Mali... And so then there's a little miniature civil war in Mali uh, with the tall reg and others. And then you've got um, some of it ends up going to Syria and gets in the hands of the FSA, which is just Al Qaeda <laughs> and, and HGS, which used to be called yeah. Al-Nasser Front, which is a, a CIA proxy army. And then uh, Ar al Sham, which is a State Department proxy army, also with Mac, some backing of elements of the Muslim Brotherhood, but not the real Muslim Brotherhood, the Saudi slash at that time Qatarish uh, military paramilitary branch of it, which is not the original MB from Egypt. All this nuance is just whatever. They're like, Talhead, evil Muslim, sand nibba, <laughs> this and that. They don't want to think about it. And I'm just like, God damn, you can't, you can't talk like that. If you don't know, then just be quiet and listen. But um, yeah. our foreign policy, I've seen 12 times on the media, which I barely watch. I just have to see, you know, what they're saying, where a senator, a, you know, top journalist, a congressman has said the Taliban is Al Qaeda like it's the same thing. And yet, in Syria, when they're arming <laughs> ISIS, that's not Al Qaeda anymore. Those are moderate yeah. rebels, right? <laughs> they're, they're, it, I, I felt like saying, calling it. It's democratic terrorism. You know how they say democratic socialism? <laughs> like yeah. it's democratic fascism. It's democratic terrorism. It's okay. It's okay. They voted for their head chopping. Like, it's totally terrorism. Even if it wasn't Al Qaeda, they'd be they'd fine. Then they're independently terrorists because they're doing terrorist things, shooting mothers up against the wall and hanging kids and chopping off people's hands and lining them up in a ditch and shooting them in the back. And I mean, they they're acting like the British Empire. See that? See that's the thing, and I'm glad you pointed that out, especially with the uh, with the kid that was wearing the MAGA hat and all this aspects of division that they're pushing. They so want us Nick, to Nick Offerman be divided. They want us to be divided, and it's important that we stand up for the truth. It's you got to stand for the truth and justice. And what happens is, especially right. now, even if you, you hate Donald Trump, that kid wasn't doing anything wrong. No, absolutely not. Had and a during, during Obama's regime, 
every other day in my home country of Pakistan would be drone struck and innocent people at their weddings at medical facilities would be getting bombed. So it's they double tap talking about that. that you that know about double tapping. Muslims were dying under Obama's regime just just because he's uh, well dressed and he's well articulated and he's on the left. Right. So they excused that. So you got to stand for the truth and you got to get Obama's a, Obama's a secret Muslim from Kenya. <laughs> the Q people were saying and it said, well, if he Obama's a secret Muslim, he's killed hundreds of thousands of Muslims. He yes. tripled the size of the war in Afghanistan. He did not pull the pull out of Iraq was an agreement that Bush the lesser actually set up in December of 2010. Uh, he tried to stay in there. He's the one that toppled Syria, invaded Libya, had the coup d'etat in Ukraine. Well, that was not Muslims. That were, he was killing Christians on that one. But, you know, plenty plenty throughout northern Africa and the Middle East where he's murdering all these people. And it, it didn't matter. And he's really, you know, they gave all the support and did drone strikes in both Pakistan and Yemen. Yeah. Uh, and they do the double tap. So they would they'd hit like a funeral or a wedding. Oh, there's a large procession of cars. Let's hit it. And then they'd time it to where when the fire department arrived, they'd go hit it a second time to hit the fire trucks. People in Yemen started doing a first, second response. They'd send in a fire truck and abandon it, wait for the drone, and then have the other fire trucks come. It's like, <laughs> you're going to have to triple tap them. This is insane. Shooting people at a wedding with a machine. Like, you're just up the even if they hit it back, okay, whatever, they hit a drone. Like It's so impersonal. I read this book called White Peace. I think I have it. This Here it is. Um, this book, I wrote one chapter, and I don't get any royalties for this. This is a big, thick book on all kinds of conflicts from everywhere. And it's got some Iraq things in here, Pakistan in here. I think, is Wahid in here? Maybe. I just saw his name. Francis Boyle's in here. Karen Katowski, Geraldi, Ray McGovern. Right? A lot of people might recognize the names. And there was a story in here about Cambodia. Mm -hmm. And because they, you know, people talk about Vietnam. They forget how much Laos and Cambodia got cluster bombed. And there's still munitions and there's still Agent Orange and all this. But he was talking, he or she, I forget. Whoever it was, they were talking about Cambodia, and I'm like, what's worse than than hatred? There's something worse than hatred. It's called indifference, where yes. rather than bombing somebody because you thought they were a threat, so you're scared or whatever, and, you know, oh, we bombed the Germans first because we thought they were that close to getting the nuclear bomb, whatever. You're bombing them to defeat them. You bomb them because you hate them. You bomb them because of revenge. You bomb them because of prejudice. But worse than that is total indifference. And when they were bombing Cambodia, there was no point. There was no threat. There was no fear. There was no hatred. It was just a, a cold, calculated choice of, well, how much do each of these munitions cost? So if we, you know, bomb x amount per day we'll get this much in our contract and they don't even care oh they just hit that village or uh, whatever to say some Viet Cong in there or something and they just drop cluster bombing jungle mountain whatever it didn't matter just just blow something up all just because they'd get paid to do the mission and they get paid to restock the ammo and all that holy yeah. crap like that's the cube level sickening indifference where people are just like ants just uh it's like a little kid that you know takes the garden hose and starts drowning ants to see like oh right, i'll give him a leaf let's see how long he lasts and it's like playing satan there actually there's a book called uh chronicles of satan by mark twain most mm -hmm. people know it's a short story it's in another book but Everyone knows um, Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer and all that. But Mark Twain, he got in trouble for this. He wrote The Chronicles of Satan, and he made an analogy of a little boy named Satan that saw two kids, like, playing with ants. And then he makes them some clay figures, and he likes, likes to play with people. And they're all excited at first, but eventually they get bored, and they, they build two castles and make them fight each other. It was, like, the most exciting thing to watch the little figures 
shoot cannons at each other and stuff. And Satan doesn't do any of it. He just shows them how to build the things because he knows what they're going to do. And uh, I, I, <laughs> it's Mark Twain. Like people should definitely read the Chronicles of Satan. Uh, and it's just it's not the devil Satan, but it's kind of like probably is. But he's in the form of a boy, mm-hmm. and all he does is indirect, and the people do it on their own. But yeah. uh, he did that ant analogy, and that was what I felt like. I'm like, man, Mark Twain called this because what they did in Cambodia was total indifference. They're just blowing up people like they're little video game people or something. Just pff, what'd that cost? Oh, good. You know, no, yeah, there's families that's, that's, down there. They don't see it. It's, oh, the distance or something. When you blow someone's head off and you smell the blood and all that and you hear the screams, it's different when aerial warfare and even worse when there's no pilot, it's just a drone that just boom, 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 boom. They just shoot, you know, at night and some white goes up and, you know, everybody's dead. They, it doesn't, like, the impact isn't there. There's that cognitive dissonance. That's what's I, scary about the future of war because it's all in the future, it's going to be drone versus drone. You know, whoever can build the most drones because they don't want to get skin in the game. And they're going to be way more willing to pull the trigger. Because they don't have the risk of losing soldiers. They're just going to lose drones. So you're going to see more attacks. and, and Or just uh, killing dissidents with drones. I'd probably be on that list. <laughs> it won't be cancel <laughs> culture. It'll be cancel the person. We'll just send a drone to his house. Say it was a car accident or whatever. You know, That's right. what I'm afraid of. <laughs> That's where we're headed. Hooray. You, you know, it's it's interesting you mention all of these things because right now there is that disconnect I see going on with humanity when I go outside and there's nobody just dealing with each other anymore on a practical level. Everyone's looking at their phones. There's no human interaction. And you are right, this next generation of warfare that we're going to be in, it, even if at the Afghanistan situation ended, that doesn't mean that the war industry has stopped. Now you have I guess, uh, new leaders in Iran and Israel who have their own situations going on. So we will see, like, exactly what you're saying is that these well, next... if they ever want to pull the trigger on Iran, they can't be sitting in Afghanistan. Yeah. They'd be sitting ducks. So you got to move them out and put them somewhere else. Which goes to my next question is, now that you have new leaders in Iran and Israel and with the Afghanistan wrap-up, how do you see that part of the world going for the next... 10 to 20 years and how would that affect us here in a, as americans well bennett is all, from israel is already talking about going solo on iran which he will not do but that's just what they're saying they're saying they're going to build two thousand more settlements in the west bank which is going to piss off the entirety of the, the islamic world and pisses me off as well uh you saw the propaganda recently about uh somebody firing on ships and that's one of their favorite things, right? The the main, the uh, the Gulf of Tonkin, which didn't happen. Of course, when the ships are actually fired on, like the Liberty or the Patria, they ignore it because the Israelis did it. And when they're not fired on, like Gulf of Tonkin, then they start a war. And they were trying to blame these attacks on Iran without evidence or motive. Mm-hmm. And so you can see the war propaganda. There's still like the Boltons and these neocons. As well as the Pelosi's and all that, that's what they want. They want a, uh, a war with Iran. What's stopping that is the, the re, well, reality. But what's stopping that is the generals in the military are going, we can't do that. Like, uh, that's a 20,000 casualties minimal if we were to attack Iran. And Israel's not going to do anything. And if they do, that's going to turn all our Arab allies against us. So yes. it'll be, be everybody versus Israel. They're, so they're not that argument of that's the unsinkable aircraft carrier is BS because that's they they weren't involved in both Gulf Wars for that reason. And we went to war with Iraq for Israel and they didn't even do any fighting overtly. Uh, I think they had some covert things in there, but you see him at Abu Ghraib with the Star of David tattoos and things. You know, we all know who it is, but yeah, yes. they um, I don't think we can get a hot war with Iran. Like, they didn't even have a hot war with Syria, these proxies. I don't want to give them any ideas, but if they were going to start an insurgency in Iran, they would get the Aziri population in the north to revolt. About 25% of Iran is from Azerbaijan. 
And if you could get even 2% of the Aziris, that would be a major internal problem for Iran. And then you lop on strict sanctions, do a couple false flag boat attacks so you can start seizing vessels to stop black market trade with Venezuela and stuff, strangle them economically, sponsor the Aziri uprising, and then try to foster uh, infighting uh, between different Shia groups. And you could turn Iran into something like Syria. And that's what they're going to try to do. Um, I'm militantly working against that. I'm on press TV. I give, I tell the Iranians, like, look, here's what the neocons are saying. Because I have moles in the working groups. And there, it's some insane stuff. Like, some of them talked about using nuclear weapons. That right. was, fortunately, was struck down by the majority who said that was crazy. I'm glad mm -hmm. they have a line somewhere. But the Aziri thing is on the table. That's one of their plots. Uh, right now, the soft targets are to hit uh, Shia militia groups in Syria, whether they are Iraqi or from Iran, doesn't matter. It, they're going to be called Iranian proxies, and they're going to uh, attack them in Deir Zor, as they have been doing. And they're going to continue to shoot mortars at U.S. bases in Iraq and blame it on Iran so that they can uh, do Soleimani-style executions. So that's the the... There's no, there's nothing Iran can do. Like they're doing, there's nothing, I mean, in, unless they want to really cross that line. I mean, they're within cruise missile range of the northern oil fields in Saudi Arabia. So if they really want to be like, you're going down with us, yeah. they could they could pull that and that would put a, a global fucking, what is it called when you pull the brake hatch? You know, it just <laughs> the whole, everything went, you know, instant stop because it wouldn't be enough oil to heat people's homes or keep the lights on. So um, that's an option. There's not, it's all ugly. And I would love to say, well, cooler heads will prevail. But you look at the leadership in all three countries, they all hate each other. They're getting yes. more and more radical. Uh, the, yeah, you know, like I'm not a fan of the theocratic state of Iran. Like they get, they're not getting the best representatives of Shia Islam. They're getting the ones that are just like the most anti-Zionist. That's I'm I'm anti-Zionist too, but that's not always what you want. Uh, when especially when you're on the weaker side, like Iran cannot win a war with the United States. They can make it not worth it to get attacked, but they're not going to be invading Virginia or anything. So, you know, <laughs> they're not even going to make it across the ocean. It's a lose-lose thing. Best they yeah. can do is say, you, you know, I'll break your nose on the way down or whatever. But uh, what they need to do is find other willing partners. Like if they can't get the Iran deal, and I swear they're just being like Charlie Brown with the football with that thing. But continue up your trade with Russia and other states. Uh, I'm sure most of Asia, China and others are more than willing to buy oil and gas from Iran. That's why, because people have broken this what embargo, unofficial embargo, is they're trying to do these boating attacks so they have a pretext to seize Iranian ships because they don't want Iranian ships going to India. Well, not India, but like to China or South Korea to where they can make money and yeah. strangle them. And it doesn't work. If you have one way out, you can sell to China or some Panama or whatever, and then they can sell to who? anybody so uh they're trying to do this boating bs iran needs not to get triggered and mine the water or fire at you know they, get, they want to get mad they want to shoot but like they're trying to get you to do that they're trying to get you to pearl harbor don't because it, you don't own the media no one will hear your side of the story they're going to start the story in the middle with whatever you bombed a boat or something and then you're going to get real hard sanctions and rebellions and this and that. So, yeah. Um, I see Israel going down in the next 20 years. Like, they got the tiger by the tail. I've seen them losing their media monopoly, especially in uh, Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. Or just nobody, no one listens to it anymore. Even Twitter, it's okay to criticize Israel to a point. Yeah. Uh, can't do it on Facebook or YouTube, but... There's Twitter censors a million other things on the virus, on the civil war, or whatever. But they're they're allowing some criticism of Israel. So, but See, uh, this is, a, this is yeah. very important. And it is people who are listening to this, 
please support Brother Ryan Dawson at a Report, which I would like to ask him now is that for the last few years, especially with the great activism and content that you have put out there, what is it that makes you like stand out from the rest of these people in terms of the knowledge that you're providing? What made them take you down? And how can the, the people details? You? Yeah, it's uh, it's the details. Like I don't do vague stuff like the elite, the globalist, the deep, <laughs> the deep state, the NWO, the you know, pick something. There's always a term for like vaguely saying they, the bad guys, or something. No, I say they're. Specifically, the architects for the war in Iraq were Douglas Fyth and Richard Pearl and Armitage and Cheney and Wormser and da 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 da. I name them all. I name the policy papers. I name the dates. One Judith Miller, like, like it's written on the, the calendar I have behind me right here. It says on August, uh, Fred Barnes lies about Atta meeting in Prague with Iraqis. That was the 12th of August. That's when. The Weekly Standard was an outfit for the Project of New American Century, PNAC. Fred Barnes and Gary Schmidt both wrote about a meeting in Prague between the uh, hijacker Mohammed Atta, who was on Flight 11 that crashed into the North Tower. They said yeah. he met with senior Iraqi officials and there was a transfer of anthrax. There was no meeting in Prague. Iraq didn't have anthrax. In fact, Al-Qaeda didn't have anthrax. Every single part of that story was false. But they reported it anyway. And then you get the lies from Judith Miller from the New York Times talking about mobile weapons labs, which contained anthrax. And then you've got the George Tenet Lewis Leibowitz written speech for Colin Powell, where he goes to the U.N. with a mock file of anthrax, stipulating, oh, a rocks in violation of U.N. Resolution 1441, saying they can't have weapons of mass destruction and they have VX gas and anthrax and da, da, da. But they lied, and the source of the lie, Fred Barnes, that wrote that on the 12th, got it from James Woolsey, the former director of the CIA, appointed by Clinton because of blackmail from Jeffrey Epstein. Yeah. James Woolsey's source was anonymous Israeli security forces. Israeli security forces witnessed the transfer. Okay, Israeli security forces did not witness the transfer because there was no meeting in Prague. And even if there had been, neither party had anthrax. But somebody writes on the note, death to America, death to Israel. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the Israelis that witnessed the meeting, and it's Israel mentioned in the anthrax notes. right? I remember that from War by Deception, mm -hmm. where, you, where you brought that up. Yeah, and uh, nothing after the fact. Like, even after they knew... The Niger forgeries, right? Oh, you have an obsolete foreign minister that's signing this alleged deal between Saddam Hussein acquiring yellow cake or oxidized uranium from Niger. It's got obsolete military seals. The dates have been fuddled with. And you know this is fake. It didn't matter. Cheney said it. Condoleezza Rice said it. George Bush said it. He's reconstituting his nuclear weapons program. Da, da, da. Okay. And that info is coming from Gorbanifar and Michael Ledeen, old school Iran Contra liars, and, and some Italian intelligence and this and that. And and I've gone over all this stuff. But okay, we know now there were no Niger documents and that they're fake. Why didn't somebody in the news say the documentation George Bush said in his speech in Ohio about uranium and da, 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 was wrong. And, and here's how we know. Look, obsolete this, obsolete that. Wrong foreign minister signed a document. He wasn't even there. That never happened. That never happened with the anthrax. It never happened with the Niger forgeries, aluminum tubes. Like, okay, you can claim, oh, we just didn't know any better. We miscalculated. Most of the intelligence said, blah, I guess we got it wrong. Why can't you, after the wars, are, you already got your way, can you still not admit mm -hmm. that every single pre-war lie was deception, not mistakes. It was deception because you knew it was a lie and you reported it anyway. Yeah. As yeah. Trump said to Jeb Bush, there were no WMDs and you knew there were no WMDs. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, before they compromised his daughter, he was on a roll. Uh, but anyway, they, they, they got him in line. 
he did a lot for Israel too. And he's, you know, he, he married into the Kushner family. <laughs> and it's so interesting, brother Ryan, that you point these things out because of the type that's, of truth. That's why I get censored to answer your question. That's, why, that's like, exactly, that's exactly why you get censored and why they take down your work and years of work that I've been watching for many years, all of it just suddenly gone overnight, which is, not the free society that we're supposed to be living in. You're, everyone has a right to state their case. Yeah. We don't have their, a free press. We, do. we, we don't have that. And which I would like to uh, for you to ask, for you to uh, basically uh, tell the people, how can they support you in terms of the work that you're putting out with ANC Report, how they can donate to you, how they can help you oh, to awesome. basically continue in this uh, era of censorship that we're in, where I myself, after in my college years and after high school learned so much from you and i owe a lot of my knowledge to you and that's and gone I, me and people like me can't talk they got rid of mike rivera's youtube and this is a guy that was doing three hour podcasts five days a week and he's got to be in his like 60s or something now and it's not like he can do it over again he didn't even have that many years left and the great ones are gone. Ramondo's gone, and a lot of other great writers are up there in age. Ray McGovern's in his 80s. Ron Paul's in his 80s. Jim Loeb. Yeah. Uh, and I don't see a lot of in between. Like I'm in my 40s, and there's there's Grant Smith. There's uh, there's some, but the 50s, 60s. There's a couple decades of like no one doing anything, <laughs> and then the Zoomers, you don't see much, and you can't anymore. But this, they censor us because they're scared, and <sighs> you get flack when you're over the target. And me, myself and a few others were the canary in the coal mine. I got censored back in 2005 and 2008. Lost my first YouTube December 2008 when the ADL partnered with them, and we all know why. <laughs> I had my MySpace deleted in 2005 because I predicted the 7-7 bombing, so they yanked everything I ever did. But I did. Someone saw it before it was removed. His name was Robert Larson. He worked for KUCI at Irving, California. That's the first radio show I was ever on. And radio was a way bigger deal back then than now. Now it's all podcasts, but radio used to be the big thing. And uh, so I have ANC Report, which stands for Anti-Neocon. That's ANC. ANCReport.com. And there's several ways to participate. You can click on, there's like a pot of gold, like an Irish pot of gold where you can donate. I'm not allowed on Patreon or PayPal, so we have to use our own websites. That's that Gabe Hoff got those erased. There's a membership option, so you can sign up for the site, which would give you access to films that I've made, which would be on 9-11, on Syria, on Palestine, the history of Israel, or isn't real. <laughs> um, <laughs> Decades of deception on the CIA, um, neocolonialism in Africa, like all, a lot of topics are in there. There's films, there's MP3s of the videos I did, over 3,000 something videos. And there's the vault. So all the stuff that got deleted between 2008 and 2021 is in the vault. If you're a member, you get access to that. And, and it's just a, a way of supporting the site. Like even if you've already seen the things or you've already watched the films, you, know, you just can watch the video, whatever. It's a way, it's a monthly subscription. And then brand new, I, I just joined Substack. Maybe you've heard of Substack, a lot of people getting on that. That's kind of like a Patreon. You write articles and podcasts and people can subscribe. Now mine is has two options. You can subscribe for free and get the articles and stuff. Or you can subscribe and pay just because you want to support what we're doing. But I'm torn between I need payment for my life, for kids and rent and all that. Yeah. But the message is also so important that I want it to reach the most people. So I'm like, what do I do? So I'm like, well, if you can afford it, become a paying member. And if you can't, then, you know, just be, get sign up for free and spread the word and tell people donate or something. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah. That's and you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because myself, at I'm currently at age 29. So for me, you're like an older brother, like uh, looking up to an older brother mm -hmm. who's leaving something behind for this world, which I would like to also ask you, Brother Ryan, is to my generation, what would you like to say? And 
also in addition to that let's say because in islam we believe every day is our last day and allah can take your soul at any time so if today was your last day on earth it's very um kierkegaard in western philosophy the of existentialism my generation and humanity if with all those things in question what message would you leave behind you know your generation all of us right now are facing this overreaction to rona and i forgot who said it but a, he's somebody man his name escapes me he said a slave is someone that's waiting for someone else to set him free yeah you gotta set yourself free just you have a very easy act of defiance just go outside without a mask you know that's that alone is telling the government to stick it and there's something called the lemming effect like monkey see monkey do when people see other people stand up they'll stand up a lot of the reason people are wearing masks is because everyone else is wearing masks and like i don't really want to believe wear this or believe it but i don't want to defend uh, my neighbors well you don't wear it they don't wear it they're like you too yeah i don't like this either you'd be amazed how many people think just like you do on that situation on the other side as far as supporting media and stuff i'm i feel like we're in the darkest spot now and there's only we're coming out of it because when i was first getting yanked off of stuff there was no bit shoot there was no odyssey there was no Substack. There was no Patreon or any of that either, actually. There's only PayPal. Um, actually, when I started, there was no PayPal either. There was no Facebook. So we didn't even have stuff to get banned from. Like, at least you temporarily have something that you can get banned from. We used to just, that the TV was God, and that was that, and you couldn't argue. The Internet has allowed us an option. And you say, oh, they're censoring the Internet. I'm like, yeah, but there used to not even be an Internet. So you got to look at the larger the larger picture is we're 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 gaining territory like there is an internet and there is telegram and vk and there are spots and that's what i see is the free market solutions capitalism works you you will be able to use entropy and odyssey to get around the the payment processor problems with paypal and stuff you will be able to use those bit shoot and things like that to get around youtube vk to get around facebook and then you've got like Mastodon, Pleroma, Gab, a whole bunch of like Twitter options. It's just a matter of time because right now they're way ahead in the numbers. But I can tell you, I don't know if you were too young for MySpace or whatever, but that was like the biggest site on the internet and it's just pff, nothing now. I see that a lot of the market share because of the censorship, because people do want to hear the other side on things, that there's going to be this great migration away from YouTube and Facebook, away from Patreon. I think Substack's going to kill Patreon. And I think uh, VK is killing, Facebook's killing itself. It's just 30-day ban, 30-day ban for the most obscure nonsense from 12 years ago. You made a joke about it. <laughs> so they're going to fall. These tech giants are going to fall. And we have to make like we learn from our mistakes. It's like, OK, they put all the eggs in one basket. They got an early start because the Internet was new. The first one to come out with this option, whatever. But if we can have viable media that doesn't censor, which we have, we just got to get the get people away from what they're addicted to. The future is so bright because I always people say politics is downstream from culture. Well, culture is downstream from media. If the people can run the media instead of this little cabal that's had it for since the 50s, if we get our media back, we get our culture back. And by the culture predicates what the politicians are going to do, because a law is just uh, words unless it's enforced. Like yeah. it's illegal to come across the border, but if you don't have any consequences, whatever, it's illegal to steal. But people just go into Walgreens and steal suitcases full of stuff because they can't get arrested. You know, yeah, and uh, but that would change if the culture would change. You couldn't do that here. You couldn't do that in Japan. You're not getting across the border without going to jail, and you sure as hell couldn't go in a store and start stealing stuff. You'd mm -hmm. be <laughs> you'd be on the ground and in a cage within a day, because there's course. consequences for that. You can't go around with selling drugs here either. Mm -hmm. Like not even weed. They're like mm -mm, you're going to jail. Um, and it works. We don't have an opioid crisis here. You could leave your wallet on the floor 
in the street. The most thing you want to do is like pick it up and put it on a bench so nobody kicks it or whatever. Mm-hmm. I had a friend from Norway. He lost 6,000 yen. It just fell out. I don't know if he's drinking or what happened, but he, he just fell on the ground. And he's so distraught. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? And he, he circled the block a few times and he found it on the ground. It's and beautiful. all these people had stepped over it. Nobody touched it. Cash. Beautiful. That, I, that maybe last that's night why. I was in a taxi and the guy says, oh, you forgot your wallet. And I was like, oh, that's not my wallet. So we opened it up and saw the ID and he called and the guy was so happy. Oh, you left your wallet in this taxi. Now, I could have taken that. I'm like, oh, thanks. But I was like, no, that's not mine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's um, a high trust society. And, this, and the, at least the southern part of the U.S. was used to be like that when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. If you lost something, somebody would return it. Nowadays, <laughs> if you lost a wallet on a subway or in a car, forget it. It's gone. You know, even the right. cops would steal it. Like, <laughs> there, there's no, <laughs> the culture's messed up. And it doesn't matter what the law is. You know, the drug law, whatever, it's illegal to do drugs, but they, if the demand is there, they're going to do it. Yeah. It needs to be where people don't want to do drugs. They don't want to steal, and they don't want to one-up each other all the time. And But we've been poisoned by the media, and the media is pitting man against woman, gay against straight, white, black, brown, whatever. You all hate, hate this, hate that. And their divisions, any division they can make, sexual orientation, ethnic group, race, religion, the, they they just twisted the knife, you know, uh, and there's no harmony. That's what it has to fix. You fix the press, that fixes everything. School, politics, culture, and the way to fix the press, we're almost, we're, we're right there. Like, I can name them, VK, BitChute, Odyssey, Telegram. Those are the companies that are for free speech, and that is how someone like myself and myself as well can use these and continue the message and research we've spent so much time digging up. I've had so many people that were used to be a neocon that are now like militantly anti-war or became a libertarian, whatever, because they would just start listening to my videos. And uh, it worked. I've, ha- I've sa- had people write me a few days ago saying I saved their marriage from some video I made I didn't even remember doing. And they they had watched it. It was new. It just came up in the thing, and they're watching it and and resolve their <laughs> their conflict in their house. I guess you know it's uh really exciting if you're 29 or so. Like I think it's the best time to be born, minus the corona stuff, because you're gonna finally have a world where common people can make media. We haven't had that for 70 years. It's been dominated by one little click, and it's a, a pro-war click. And so the distrust in big pharma, the distrust in corporate media, the distrust in whatever they're saying on TV about health, about science, about you name it, no one believes them anymore because they've lied so much about foreign policy. They wouldn't even debate foreign policy in the last presidential debates. They just didn't do it, right? Yeah. That I think the younger people are a little – a little red pilled on, on the media. They're like, they lie. And they're looking around and they're making mistakes. They're tripping up. They're falling for QAnon or Alex Jones or whatever. And there's <laughs> potholes. There's potholes on the on the way out, but they are full they are finding the old work of a Justin Ramondo or they're finding a Mike Rivera or Ryan Dawson, a Scott Horton, a, a Grant Smith, a, um a Max Blumenthal, the old work of Robert Perry or Will Grigg and they're finding Consortium News, Antiwar.com, um, The Gray Zone, whatever, you know. The, the, on the left, the John Pilger, the, the, um, the WikiLeaks, obviously, and Snowden and so on. And they're realizing, man, this is out there. There are people that understand this stuff that are telling us the truth. Glenn Greenwald is another one on the left. He's also on Substack. Um. I think that's really exciting. So don't get black pilled. What it is is you're being aware of stuff that's always happened. Like all these pedophile rings of like, well, that was always around. At least you know about it now. That is a step in the right direction. And they're going down. I made this big map of like the mafia of Jeffrey Epstein. Mm -hmm. And we're going through it. Like, look at when I made the map, nobody had gone to jail except for Epstein. And now 
Maxwell's in prison. Epstein's dead. Peter Nygaard's in jail. Harvey Weinstein's in jail. Keith Raniere's in jail. Claire Bronfman's in jail. Luke Burnell's in jail. John yeah. Luke Burnell. Um, that's six. But there were when I was looking at it, there was like nine of them that are all in prison. Sarah Bronfman's also in jail. Leon Black had to step down from his position. Of course, Epstein went to jail and then never never made it out. <laughs> no, um, no one gets away Steve with Hoffman anything. went to jail and, and served his time and got out. So there are consequences for these pedophiles. Um, it's not being blasted all over TV. And that's another very interesting thing. There hasn't been a story in a long time with as much public interest as Jeffrey Epstein. That all these people want to know every little detail of what was going on. And there's total media silence. So anyone says, oh, the media just does things for ratings. It's corporate. I'm like, no, it's not. It's ideological. They're not touching Jeffrey Epstein because it goes back to Israel. And, so, and they know it would be a huge story. They know they would make more money than ever. And any little sentence, Prince Andrew's being sued by Virginia Dufresne. Uh, yeah, all the public would gobble it up. You have princes, prime ministers. You got – look at the people in the black book. Bill Clinton, Tony Blair. Ehud Omar, Ehud Barat, royals from Spain, royals from the United Kingdom, um, the heads of state all the way to the top. Then you got hedge fund managers and billionaires, you know, Glenn Dubin, Ava Dubin, Les Wexner, Leon Black, Apollo Management, you know, Kraft, uh, Conrad Black. Uh, it's just like the movers and shakers of the world are involved in this giant criminal ring. It should be the biggest story we've ever seen. Gets less t- less than one zillionth of the attention of the O.J. Simpson trial. You know, that should just be blasted on every little factoid about the Maxwells and Bill Gates and uh, I mean, it's everybody. Bill Gates continued to finance Jeffrey Epstein after he'd been arrested. So did two mm-hmm. other Microsoft employees. And then you've got all the sexual depravity, just, just the degenerate debauchery and all this like with the Khashoggi's and the, uh, the just all of the, the Staley's and the people from Bear Stearns and all the white collar crime. What a huge story. Nothing. Nothing from Fox or CNN or anything in between. Nothing. And that lets you know they're part of it. See, that, that's basically why they lost the trust of the people, especially mm-hmm. my generation, because when you're not going to address the truth, that's you're going to lose the people's trust and that's it only where... takes 10 minutes though like you find one of my epstein videos or something oh there's this guy online and he's got all this documentation you start pulling on that yarn and it just it's, it's it doesn't end right it's just oh man this guy and this guy and this guy and then you're like i didn't see any of this on tv i don't believe anything they're saying on any of this stuff that's you absolute. had the daughters of the bronfman seagram liquor billionaire Canadians, right, were involved in the Nexim cult, which was branding women with like a hot iron, like you would a cow, and raping children. And it's just disgusting. Got convicted and sentenced and are sitting in prison. Nobody knows. Yep, that's exactly right. it's not on TV. This is why I get banned. (laughs) I will say it. I'll come See, it. that's why I wanted to reach out to you to, because you are stating these truths and I wanted to get your voice out there, especially in a time where people are wondering, where is Ryan Dawson? Where is he? And we looked up to him. He was teaching us the truth. Now, all of a sudden, he's been wiped. So that's the reason what motivated me, because you're, you're, you're like an older brother to me. I love you dearly for all the years of education you have not just given me, but to all of humanity. But it's very important that people think about these things and all these truths that you have shared with us and why it's important and put two and two together that why is this truth not being shared? Why is Ryan Dawson not being talked about? Well, they call me an anti-Semite, Holocaust denier, kicks puppies, peed on baby Jesus. Like, you know, (laughs) I've got dedicated. They just it's that's all. None of that's true, by the way. But they say it anyway, because the accusation alone will get you canceled. I've been yeah. called a white supremacist. I might really. <laughs> you're, you're not. You're not a white supremacist. No, it's, it's, I've got it's mixed race terrible. children. <laughs> like <laughs> exactly. And ever I've since never, I've, I've never watched. said anything remotely of any sort of supremacy for anybody. But that they're just like you're a white supremacist. I'm like, what is that? From where? How the hell? 
where'd you get that from? Yeah. You know, I've never said anything like that. Um, they call me a Holocaust denier because I talk to revisionists. I'm like, did you listen to it? Because I won that debate, right? Like, and and converted the guy to my side. Yeah. No, you talk to so and so. That makes you so and so. No, it doesn't. I had <laughs> communists on. We had a debate. I won that debate too. Didn't make me a communist. <laughs> like, exactly. This is smear. Saying white supremacy is just something. It's one of those things. It's like the she's a witch. She looks like one. You know, it's like that level of dumb, but they know that accusation carries so much weight. And a lot of people just really want to condemn that. Like, oh, why I hate racism. Yes, we all do. Uh, that they want to believe it because they want to get a pat on the head for condemning it. And they don't look at the concept. Well, like, what if that person isn't a racist? And look what you're doing to them. You're ruining their career, their life, their future and the future of their family. And those are the kind of hit pieces that have gone out. And I got a race. I lost 15 years of work on YouTube. I lost all my PayPal, all my Patreon, my Vimeo, um, any video platform of, of the old school is gone. I lost my Facebook. I lost my Twitter. I lost my all my YouTubes. Um, and I lost a lot of money doing that. And like, why? Because the majority of Palestinians and stuff will never know what I've been saying or doing. Because yeah. it's not even... Right. They don't even speak English. So, and the Rockies, and they'll never even know what I'm doing. I get no benefit <laughs> from anything. And uh, sorry, my eyes are itching. I was moving a weight bench. I got like metal flakes in my eyes. My face is melting. <laughs> oh, no, no, no worries. I was so, making a baby room yesterday and I had to move my weight bench. And I got like rust in my eyes yesterday and I got it uh, drops. I think I'm going to need another round of that kind of tearing up here but, yeah so w w with that uh i would al also like to ask you like your closing thoughts to finish up this podcast and i would also like to i'm gonna wipe you it on that. To <laughs> give, give you permission to download this video when it's uploaded and use it as you see fit and oh thank I would, you i would like to tell I everyone to that. support anc report and to mm. i'll put the links in the description below and I would like uh, Brother Ryan Dawson to conclude his uh, thoughts on this podcast. I think you need to fight censorship for anybody, even the people you don't like. I don't I'm not a big fan of Nick Fuentes or Laura Loomer or any of that, but they shouldn't be censored. Not even David Duke. Like you got to allow dialogue. Sunshine's the best way to get rid of bad ideas. And who's to say what's. You know, who gets to decide what censor, what is it? You need to say none. And mm -hmm. so whether it's someone like me or Rivero or, you know, someone on the alt-right or radical left, whatever, we're supposed to support free speech. And that means everybody. Um, I don't even if it's like the, the world socialist traveler or whatever, don't censor it. Let Just let people talk. The good ideas are going to win out. Mm -hmm. um, but censorship's just an excuse, and that is the. I, I want you to be anti-war, and you can protest COVID, and you can do all that. But the most important action you can take is supporting alternative media, because the way we're going to flip the culture is by getting information, is winning the information war. And a pair, I don't want to steal that from Jones, but it's true. There is an info war, <laughs> and we've been getting our butt kicked until recently. We had some victories up up to about 2014 or so. You could get a, you could say most things on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. You can't anymore, and so you just got to leave those platforms. I know I said it a lot, but that I, I cannot stress it enough. If you really want to end war, you really want to fight these global pedophiles, criminals, global narcotics trafficking, terrorism, all these terrible things, sanctions that cause starvation. All you can't change the politics without changing the culture, and you can't do that without the media. We win the media. We win everything. And when there's already a lot of established people that have lots of videos we're migrating so i'm very excited about odyssey and substack and the things i've been naming if you go to ancreport.com we have a list of things you can join and other patriots that uh could use your support so i've got a telegram channel if people want to add that if you have telegram and all of those links are on ANC report and a copy of this video will be up there soon too i really yeah. appreciate it brother and i'm glad I'm glad that, you know, a, a 
an immigrant from Pakistan that was in third grade from 9-11, like, finds a random Native American in Japan's videos in 2012. <laughs> that's, well, the, that's, you know, that's the greatness of what, um, The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says that in your life, Allah has already destined your companions and friends and your teachers and your brothers. So I was uh, I was destined to meet you, and I pray the Most High Creator blesses you, your family, your brother, your wife, your children, and encompasses you with such protection that any evil that comes around you or tries to do anything to you is deflected back at them times ten. So my love and prayers are always with you, my brother. And I'll say, I'll say a little prayer for my sister-in-law. She's pregnant. So yeah. that's the newest uh, baby Dawson may be on the way. So. Congratulations, Andrew, my brother. That good for, note. We're, we're multiplying. <laughs> <laughs> thank you and much love and good night, everybody. And thanks again, brother Ryan. Peace.